Good afternoon, everyone. I hope you're enjoying this beautiful day. Uh, thank you all for joining the Ohio Legislative Children's Caucus for today's meeting. To learn more about the caucus, please visit our website at www.ohiochildrenscaucus.org. If you have any questions or comments for our panelists at any time, please post them here in the chat and we will do our best to answer your questions during our Q&A. Uh, my legislative aide, Molly Vincent, will be handling that a little later on. Uh, this meeting is being recorded and will be accessible at the Ohio Legislative Children's Caucus YouTube channel. We will put that link in the chat. All the slides, content, recording, links shared in the chat, and other resources will be shared with you via a follow-up email after this presentation. Thank you for your, our esteemed panel for their afternoon conversation. We are appreciative of your time and your expertise. Uh, the three that will be talking this afternoon, first one will be Don Radke. He's the CEO of Home Life, Ready Nation Ohio Report for Child Care. Then we will hear from Reverend John Jones. He's the CEO from Hope Toledo, Community Voice, what do these numbers mean in Toledo? And the last one will be Sarah Lytle, PhD, Ready Nation Brain Source Presentation. Ohio is currently facing a child care crisis, a situation concerned for uh, parents, child care providers, and employers. Ohio has the lowest eligibility for publicly funded child care in the country for children ages zero to five. In comparison, North Carolina recently updated their eligibility to 200% of the federal poverty level for the same age group, leaving Ohio at a lower threshold of 145% of FPL. This makes it difficult for many working parents to qualify for the PFCC, which is the publicly funded child care, limiting their access to affordable child care which in turn often affects their ability to gain and maintain employment. Uh, here, we often hear from businesses almost daily about the need for qualified employees, and this would certainly help if we had better childcare. Today, we're going to learn about the state of childcare in Ohio, how Ohio's current childcare policy affects families and communities, and the importance of quality, affordable childcare and early education. I will now turn it over to Don Ranke, who will introduce the Nation Ready Ohio Report on childcare. Mr. Ranke, it's all yours. Thank you, um, and thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. Um, I'm Don Ranke. I am the CEO for Home Life Companies, Inc. We own and operate um, assisted living communities nursing homes, uh, retirement communities uh, around the country. And our biggest issue is uh, staffing, uh, you know, all shifts um, because of the, because of this child uh, care um, problem. So I am also the Delaware County treasurer where uh, I manage about $350 million worth of investments. And uh, last year, uh, end up making 14 million of interest and this year about 15 million of interest. So again, I want to thank the Legislative Children's Caucus for inviting me to share Ready Nation's most recent state survey today. Ready Nation is a business leader, member organization dedicated to building a skilled workforce, strong economy by promoting evidence-based solutions that prepare children to succeed in education, work, and life. As you will hear, Central to this work currently is the issue of child care. Just to give you an example today uh, in my office, the treasurer's office, we had two employees that had to leave. One had a, uh, a sick child and had to go pick him up from school. So she's out for the rest of the day. And the second one, um, she's a grandmother and she had to take her uh, granddaughter to, to child care and then pick them up. Was probably about two hours with a lost work. Um, Nation Ready's business membership is now more than 2,000 strong. We just released a new report, Insufficient, uh, 
infant and toddler uh, child care costs, Ohio, $3.85 billion annually. $3.58 billion annually. This report summarizes sobering data about the economic impacts of our child care crisis on families due to the negative effects of their work lives on businesses, due to the stress on their workforce, and on the state's economic uh, economy and its taxpayers in terms of lost tax revenues. Ready Nation Ohio commissioned a survey of working parents and infants, parents of infants and toddlers in Ohio. The survey sampled 408 parents, both mothers and fathers, of children ages birth to three. 83% of the working parents survey reported that child care access presents a challenge and more than half said it was a significant challenge to find child care that is either affordable or high quality. I wouldn't say it's a huge problem here in Delaware County for a couple of reasons. One, um, most of our uh, employees here at the county make between $22 and $25 an hour and it you know, costs them $11,000 a year for child care. I mean, it's just really tough on them to be able to find good um, child care. And secondly, we just don't have very many uh, child care facilities. So many people, many of these folks have to drive to Franklin County to get that care. The cost of insufficient child care in Ohio is immense. To paint a picture for you, we now, we know that 63% of our 395,000 children, birth to three, have mothers in the workforce. And 39% of Ohioans live in a child care deserts where there are more than three children under the age of five for each licensed child care slot. More than one third, 39% of Ohio residents live in a child care desert where there are more than three children under the age of five for every licensed care slot. That's very true here in Delaware County. The, this especially impacts our families who, who have infants and toddlers or are low income, non-traditional working hours, or live in rural areas. Now, non-traditional working hours you know, could be a second shift with one of my uh, assisted living facilities or nursing homes or third shift. Really tough. Um, and it's really tough because they just don't make the money that I would say would to, to help solve this problem. You know, I, like I said, I run retirement communities across the country and ensuring we have the appropriate staffing for all levels is one of my biggest challenges. In fact, in Finley, Ohio, we worked with Blanchard Valley Health System to build a child care that is on campus and is open non-regular hours to accommodate not only the facilities, uh, parents and, ch and children, but the area hospital, which uh, Blanchard Valley Health System is is the major hospital there, and manufacturing plants. As you know, they have three uh, top 100 businesses uh, in Finley. The economic impact accrued to parents, employers, and taxpayers. For each year, a child under three without sufficient care, child care, the parents take a hit of about $5,320 per working parent for a total across all parents of children under the age of three of 2.41 billion. That's a B for billion. Employers take a hit of $1,900 per working parent for a total uh, of 862 million. And the future in, in, in the hit to the taxpayers is $1,270 per working parent for a total of 576 billion. And you can see a lot of that uh, with slide 10 and 11. When we take this data and estimate economic impact for Ohio, the sobering facts is that the current child care crisis impacts on family, businesses, taxpayers could be costing Ohio 3.85 billion each year. You know, I participated in the initial Ready Nation report analysis received back in 2020. And at the time, the national cost for insufficient child care was $57 billion nationally and $1.7 billion for Ohio. To address this economic crisis, we must make sound investments in our community throughout the state to ensure quality learning is available and we meet the need of the local workforce. It would be a super wise investment. You know, we look at Intel. 
and its impact on central Ohio. And one of the big impacts it will have is not enough child care uh, to, to ensure that they can cover all three of their shifts. You know, and there could be public private uh, investment tools. Uh, the state house could, you know, issue tax credits to parents uh, and to help them afford it. And, you know, they could work in conjunction with uh, businesses to, you know, build um, the facilities and try to make sure they get good staff. Um, the economic impacts not only harm parents, but they also harm employers and taxpayers. The cost of parents are in the form of lost wages currently due to lower productivity, lost time in the workforce and disruptions like quitting or being fired or let go. Parents also lose future income to a diminished uh, career prospects. You know, like today, I told you we had two of our um, folks have to leave. One, one had a sick child and she's gone the rest of the day and a grandmother that had to pick up her uh, granddaughter, uh, pick them up and take them into a child care facility. You know, and I'm very, um, we're very fortunate. I'm very lenient because I understand the problem. And, but that's, that's pretty much an everyday, um, an everyday situation here. Uh, in my retirement community, it's a much bigger issue because I've got staffing levels. I've got to maintain, you know, for second and third shift. So that makes it a little bit tougher. Employer costs result from lower productivity, extra expenses related to rehiring. Employers also incur future costs due to lower workforce capital. Tax revenue is lost both currently and in the future due to parents' lower incomes and less consumption of taxable goods, as well as lower business re revenue. Child care industry was already very fragile pre-pandemic. The situation is far worse now, and it's costing our economy billions every year. You know, I just want to end with the fact that um, in Ohio, a parent has to pay a little bit over $11,000 a year for child daycare. And so when it comes down to it, it's almost a thousand dollars a month. And like I said, here at the county, you know, our wages for uh, folks um, are twenty two to twenty five thousand or twenty two to twenty five dollars an hour. You know, and that's forty four to fifty thousand. You take eleven thousand dollars out of that. You know, just the uh, cost of inflation eats pretty much everything else. I mean, we're in a really serious situation here. It would be great. Um, if we could get uh, the Ohio legislature to work with us to um, build facilities, um, help build facilities, and maybe do tax um, credits for businesses that are willing to do like what Birdshaven did, Blanchard Valley did in, in Finley. If you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. And thank you for allowing me to discuss this very important issue. Uh, thank you, Mr. Reinke. Uh, we will take questions at the end, but okay. I'm sure we will have uh, a few good ones. I'm, I'm sure you'll, you're going to stay with us uh, until the Absolutely. end. Th thank you, Mr. Reinke. That was very informative. Uh, next, we're going to hear from Reverend John Jones, who will walk to us, uh, talk to us about how all those numbers translate for families in the Toledo area. Uh, Reverend Jones. Good morning um, or afternoon. I feel like it's still morning. I'm running really fast. So thank you so much um, for allowing us to be here um, and for us to share um, just a few minutes um, related to how um, Toledo, Lucas County, our neck of the woods is responding, how we are responding to um, not just the information um, provided by Ready Nation, but also just what we're seeing overall. Um, in our community. So I must preface this by saying first, thanks to um, Children's Defense Fund um, and the work that they're doing um, and obviously Ready Nation. Um, huge shout out to Cindy Reese. Uh, we were just together last week because we had a chance to present this and release this collectively together while Hope was doing its annual report um, and sharing. And so um, I'm going to share a few slides and try to hustle through this so we can stay ahead of time because Mr. Ranky's done a really good job of uh, navigating through this information pretty fast. Um, and so I'm going to share and hopefully you all can see um, 
see my screen there, I think. I hope so. Yes, okay. we can. Sweet. Um, so um just to just just to walk through real quick, and I always level set um every presentation that I walk through and just talk a, a tad bit about hope and our mission. Uh we started approximately um, four years ago, um, five when you count, count in planning work uh, with a group of really dedicated individuals across the Toledo Lucas County area, um, thinking about how we can address um, the lack of um, coordinated efforts um, around access to early childhood education and child care and really addressing the crisis that we were seeing um, amongst our families um, with our children uh, being able to get a strong start for their future. So the mission of Hope Toledo, you see it there on the screen already, um, really to support and ensure high quality education. Um, and the goal of this is to create generational economic change that betters our families and communities. Um, you all will get this slide um, deck um, as it goes out. Um, to everybody. So I'm not going to read through all of our belief statements, but two that jump out um, is obviously every person should have access to affordable, high quality education near them. And that is part of our belief system. And then we also believe that a strong start in preschool makes the difference for success that is experienced later in life. And that's in kindergarten and beyond. And I know all of you on here understand that um, and get it. So let's talk a little bit about what um, Toledo is seeing, has seen, and how we have addressed it. Um, and we'll do that in that order. Um, and so four years ago, five years ago, we did some digging on um, our children in the Toledo region. And so the map that you see on your screen um, is a map of Toledo um, and parts of Lucas County, not entirely Lucas County, but you see parts of it there. And each one of those little black dots, if we were closer and in person, um, all of those little black marks on there represent um, a individual child, a four-year-old um, represented in the city of Toledo, um, which is approximately 4,000 four-year-olds. If we were to look at um, the number of four-year-olds in Lucas County, that number um, is right around 5,000 um, across the entire county. Um, we also looked at then and have updated this slide as we've continued to go on is what does KRA look like, kindergarten readiness assessment um, in our county um, specifically in our city and then in our county. And so this slide sort of gives you that construct. And so the bars represent the last two years, um, um, the sort of orange and blue. And then the line across represents where we currently sit in our county, which is the gray bar, which is just a titch below 30% of kids at the demonstrating level on the KRA. And then the statewide KRA, as most of you either know or, or will know, is right around 35%. And I should note that that is a drop from the last year KRA, um, which was sitting at about 33 and 38% respectively for our county and our city. We also looked at in Toledo is what this correlates to KRA, kindergarten readiness assessment, what it correlates to is it relates to um, poverty and the high rates of poverty in and around Toledo. And so the darker the red indicates the um, um, higher the, the rates of uh, poverty um, that exists in those areas of the community. Um, and obviously then the colors corresponding to that um, represent the kindergarten readiness assessment based on um, where those high rates of poverty are. And with one exception, obviously, and you'll see on this next slide, we've in Toledo, we've done a lot of good work and in the in, in, in the county, a lot of good work at trying to concentrate these efforts in a few particular spots. And on this next slide, you can sort of see where those concentrated efforts are. So the, the greener the dot, the green dot indicates um, a five star center, a red dot would indicate a one star center. The larger the dot size indicates the capacity um, for students, um, for children inside of those centers. So as you can see, um, there is clearly a concentration of efforts that's been done over time um, to try to concentrate um, centers that are of high quality in those areas. But if you notice going out here towards the West, and this leads to the conversation that Mr. Ranke just shared about those child care deserts that exist across the state of Ohio in our neck of the woods, that child care desert, desert really exists as you cross 475, 23, um, going north, um, south and north there, and you can see those challenges that we face. This slide, and this is just one more 
uh, bullet point that we dug through indicates the placement of five-star centers, four-star centers, and three-star centers on the step up to quality scale. Green is five, blue is four, three um, is red. Again, you can see where out here, sort of west of um, of 23, 475, you can see where the number of centers that are of three, four, and five-star um, step up to quality ratings um, goes off. And I do realize step up to quality is in the process possibly of changing, uh, but obviously that's the, the ratings that we have now. So you can see the concentration in Toledo and then beyond. A few more things that we looked at. I don't have to go through this because I know we all understand, or at least I believe we do, the challenges that we're facing as it relates to the high cost. And Mr. Ranke already covered that. But then also, which is critical to us, is the median pay for child care workers, this is on a national scale. And here locally in, in Lucas County, we found the same thing to be true. It's hovering right around $13 an hour um, is the average hourly pay for workers in the early childhood space. Um, and so for us, that is extremely alarming because clearly you cannot um, recruit and retain um, phenomenal teachers in that space when that happens. Just to dig uh, just a tad deeper, and this touches on the information um, that has been shared by Ready Nation, and I think I need to highlight one of the things that we've seen begin to move and build traction locally here in Toledo it, are these numbers produced by Ready Nation over the last few years. Um, so when you talk about the impacts across the nation, $122 billion, um, it's alarming that Ohio sits at number seven on that list um, um, behind states like Texas and Florida, and you can walk the list. And so then when you did do the deep dive, which Ready Nation has done as it relates to what is going on right here um, in Ohio and looking at those numbers, I don't need to repeat those. Mr. Ranke already has shared many of them, but just to highlight where Lucas County is, um, nearly 70% of our homes that have both parents inside of them, um, either either seventy percent of those homes have either one or both parents working. In a home where only one parent is there, fifty five percent is the number of a parent that is working outside of that space. So we see the impact, um, and we have driven and sounded the alarm very loudly as to um, the economic impact and the economic driver that early childhood education both is and has um, in our space. And so we think that is critically important. Um, I should also note, and you see the other bullet on this slide, is that a single adult with one child um, living in the home is making about 38% of the living wage, with the living wage in our neck of the woods is 22 bucks an hour. Um, and they're only earning 38% um, of that living wage. And so when we start talking about how can families thrive, not just survive, but thrive, it is critically important that we address this issue of the workforce behind the workforce, because we need our parents being able to go to work. And how they're able to do that is by having a strong child care um, and early education system that supports them in the process. So what is hope done? And just a few slides to talk about what we've done in a, in a very short time. And I must signal um, a shout out to my um, um, comrades who are across the state, um, our friends in, in various pockets of the state, whether that's in Cleveland with UPK and Pre for Clee or Dayton and their uh, preschool promise, Cincinnati preschool promise, the folks at uh, Ready Nation 5 or, or Ready five, ready five, I think it is in Columbus, um, and all of our partners that are um, in this work. We're just one component of it um, here in Lucas County, but I have to shout out the great work they're doing and have been doing before we even got into the mix. Um, and so we're working to build a comprehensive community based approach to early child care education, um, early child care and education in our community. That's our goal. I think we all have that same goal, getting kids ready for kindergarten and subsequent successful school performance. Here's what we took as a blueprint. Some of this we gathered from um, from a few other spots, but we obviously want low ratios. Having a culturally relevant curriculum is key. This focus on teachers is really important to me, and I'll be very honest, um, learning the low rates of pay, because I did, can't say I knew this um, um, five years ago, how 
abysmally bad it is. <laughs> um, and I say that as kindly as I can, but our focus is to make sure that we increase that inside of the work that we've been doing. And so we drive to ensure that teachers inside of these classrooms are not getting paid that average pay of 13 bucks, not even 15 bucks. We try to push it close to 20 bucks an hour. And we're making efforts now um, to take it even above that um, because we know what the living wage is and how do we get them um, at living wage and beyond. But then we also know that parent and family engagement is important. And then how do we support the actual center from a business perspective? Um, we have partnered with with the, our um, child care resource and referral, which is housed at the YWCA here of Northwest Ohio and another organization, Toledo Early Learning Coalition. We have partnered with them um, to create what we call the Northwest Ohio Shared Service Alliance, where we support um, in a now pilot fashion, but support providers with that back office business supports that is so critically necessary for them to be um, the excellent providers of care that they are. And so those are pretty much our blueprints. This slide shows you where we have housed this work um, over the past um, two years. And if you remember that initial map, we've identified those centers that are inside Toledo. And now we're working towards outside Toledo, which is why you see All for Kids, which is the only five-star center in Holland. We've made sure we've partnered with them so that we can begin to grow this um, as we move um, towards that effort. Just a few numbers um, that I think is important for us to, realize, um, to see. The biggest one is that middle number. So for the city of Toledo, um, the, as far as it relates to kindergarten readiness for those that are at the demonstrating level, um, in Toledo public schools, that number right now is at about 16 and a half percent, almost 17%. Washington local, which still sits in Toledo is at about 17%. Springfield, which is right outside Toledo is about 24%. What we saw through the last two years of us doing this work is are the students who came out of a hope sponsored classroom 30% of those children were at the demonstrating level on the KRA. So we see that the work that we're doing is providing benefit. We're beginning to see a trend, which we think is important. And the other numbers around the horn, which I think I should um, just shout out, is it relates to the partners we have, which is 27 different child care partners um, that are centers that we're working with. The 900 and the 800, and I'll just show you on the next slide, various touch points that we have with families and the hours of classroom teacher professional development development and support that we're providing. So we're trying to really work to support the center and the classrooms um, that we see. We do um, class assessments for those of you that are familiar um, in the space. And so we do classroom assessment scoring system. So we look at the environment in the classroom and then we use that assessment um, and come back around and make sure that we've developed plans for the teachers in the classroom as they're working with their children. Um, we've got a phenomenal team here doing that work, but none of it could be done without the tapestry of connectivity across our community. Um, our next steps and where we're going is really trying to take this to scale. So we're having very serious conversations here locally about what public support looks like. But at the same time, um, which is why this call and this webinar is so critically important, is that we've got to have a statewide approach to this um, that allows us to navigate through this, not just here locally in Toledo, but also across our entire state. Because what we know is that when our children are well, we know that our community both can be and is well. And so we're real grateful for the opportunity to present. Um, and that's you know pretty much my slides and we happy to take questions later on um, as we get to that point. So thanks for having us here and allowing us the opportunity to share. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Reverend Jones, very informative. And I think the fact that we have Ohio Chamber getting involved, realizing how important it is will be very helpful. But I like the fact that you've uh, included a lot of data that you're collecting. I think data uh, it does a better job of, of selling it. So appreciate yes, that. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next, we have Dr. Lytle, who will discuss brain science and the importance of early learning. Doctor? Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, it's a pleasure to follow uh, Mr. Ranke and Reverend Jones. And I think that that what I'd like to do is, is share some of the brain science and the importance of early learning um, that really supports a lot of a lot of this conversation that we're having today. 
Um, so if we could share my slides, that would be wonderful. Thank you. And I must say, I, I um, am no longer living in, in Ohio, but I grew up in Ohio and, and spent all of my formative years there. So this is, it's a pleasure to support this meeting today. All right, so we're going to talk about brain science, the brain basics and thinking about the case for starting early. So I think that you've heard, you know, a lot of data and information, both about the state of child care um, in Ohio and across the country. A lot of, you know, some, some wonderful information from Reverend Jones about some of the work that's happening in Toledo. And I think, you know, what I'd like to do is, is back us up a little bit to, to think more specifically about why it's so, so very important to start early. Is what slide do you want me on, Sarah? I am so sorry. No, it's okay. It's it's uh, the first one that is the title slide that says Brain Basics, the case for starting early. Basics. I'll get there. <laughs> it's fine. There we yeah. go. Thank Perfect. you so That's much. Good. Awesome. Thank you. Um, so if you want to flip to the next one. So I'm currently serving as the executive director of a nonprofit organization called Playful Learning Landscapes Action Network. Um, and we are, well, I'll talk a little bit about the work that we do later on, but um, I have been, been a researcher in the past, um, done research on children's development, children's brain development, and I'm very uh, happy to be part of the Brain Science Speakers Bureau that is that is sponsored by Ready Nation. So that's the capacity that I'm coming to you today um, to really think about how these high quality experiences are uh, really shape children's early brain development. Next slide, please. So one of the very fundamental things that we know about children's brain development is that um, is that when children are born, their brain is already about 25% of what, what it will eventually be as adult size. Um, that's really big, actually. If you think about your adult height or weight and divide by four, that would be a very big baby. Um, so children's brains already account for a relatively large portion of their body. And if you zoom ahead five years and think about, you know, the children's brains when they're entering kindergarten, we know that the brain is already about 92% of the size it will eventually be um, as an adult. Now, that, of course, does not mean that the brain is 92% done developing. We know that there's a lot that children have to learn um, between the ages of five and when they're when they're fully formed and have a mature brain as an adult. But we, what we know is that the size, this, this relative you know, mass of the brain grows very, very quickly in those earliest years. Next slide, please. And so the work of that early brain growth is really all about developing these connections between neurons or the brain cells in the brain. So when you're born, you have almost all of those neurons or brain cells that you'll ever have in your life. Um, but what's missing are the connections between them. It's almost as if you have all of the telephone poles, but not the wiring that, that connects them, that allows information and communication to pass back and forth. And so during those earliest years of a child's life, kids are really busy forming those connections between the neurons in their brain, forming the pathways that will allow the, the later functions to take place relatively seamlessly. And so kids are having these experiences and, and forming connections based on the experiences that they have and the frequency of those experiences. And so the more that you know a child cries and, and expects and learns to expect that somebody is going to come over and comfort him or her, um, that child is going to develop that pattern in the brain, knowing that I can ask for help and help will be given to me. Um, you can think about the, the sort of converse of that, which would be that if a child you know learns to expect that if I cry... I don't actually get the comfort that I'm looking for. I'm going to have to develop a different strategy for getting comfort and getting attention and, and, and help when I need it. And then those are the pathways that are going to be formed. So pathways and connections form based on the frequency of experiences, whether those experiences are good or bad. And so that, you know, on a very fundamental level, I think is a good case for providing children with those high quality, positive experiences early in life. Next slide. And so when we think about brain development, you can kind of think about this brain development as proceeding through a three-stage process. So at an early stage, all of those connections and brain development is really blooming. You're making new connections. You're having, you know, as a child, the, every experience you have, nearly every experience you have is going to be a new one, a novel one. And so you're creating all kinds of new connections in the brain. Your, your brain is just really kind of soaking it up um, and, and developing um you know, all of those capacities that it might need in the future. But eventually you get more data from those earliest experiences. You start to understand which of those experiences that seem to happen frequently over time and which are experiences that, you know, might happen once or twice, but don't really happen very frequently over time. And so your brain takes all of this data, says all of those things that happen very frequently in my life, I'm going to hang on to those. 
some of those other connections that I'm not using very frequently, I'm going to start to prune those away. And that's that second stage of brain development. So you have the blooming and then the pruning. But what this means is that the remaining connections in the brain, the one, that, the ones, those connections and, and uh, pathways that your brain holds on to, those are allowed to thrive in the future. And so it's, I, I will very readily admit that I am not a gardener, but if I were, and I have heard tell that it's like a rose bush, because if you prune a rose bush, you get rid of all those connections that are really not productive. And it really allows your rose bush to thrive over time. So you have this blooming, pruning, and then thriving process in the brain. And so the more that we can provide children with those high quality early experiences, the more we give them those frequent experiences um, that are that are positive and are high quality, those are the pathways that are going to be formed in the brain. And that's what's going to allow children to be really ready for those experiences later on. Now, one piece of this is, is that I think is really interesting is noting that when babies come into the world, they're really prepared to learn anything that the you know, that, that the world throws at them. And you can go to the next slide, please. And so we oftentimes think of these children as baby universalists. Kids come in into the world prepared to learn whatever language is in their environment, to learn whatever kinds of experiences they 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 uh, experience very frequently. But over time, that blooming, pruning, and thriving process means that kids are really become specialists in their own lives. They be, they learn the language or languages that are spoken around them. They learn the experiences that are most frequently going to happen in their lives. And that's what really allows them to be a specialist in their own life. And so our goal then in terms of providing children with the highest quality, early, earliest experiences is to really prepare children to thrive in their lives. Next slide, please. The other reason we know that this is so incredibly important is that we know that the plasticity of the brain changes over time. So not only is there rapid brain development happening in those earliest years, but we know that as, as we age, as we grow uh, later on in life, your ability to learn new skills really does diminish over time. It doesn't mean that learning ever stops. We can all go out and learn new skills tomorrow if we wanted to. But it's going to take us a lot more effort. It's going to take us a lot more time. We're actually probably going to use different areas of our brain to learn those new skills than if we had learned them when we were when we were infants and toddlers and preschoolers. So those earliest years are really an opportune time for, for setting kids up for success later on. It doesn't mean that the window of opportunity is ever closed, but we know that the most easeful and, and effortless learning occurs in those earliest years. Next slide, please. So the World Health Organization and um, and UNICEF and the and uh, the World Bank have identified five components of nurturing care. So these components are good health, adequate nutrition, responsive caregiving, security and safety, and opportunities for early learning. And all five of these are really critical as we think about supporting the whole child development in those earliest years. Next slide, please. But what I'd like to do now is just focus a little bit more on two of these. So those opportunities for early learning and responsive caregiving, because that's really, uh, really germane to the discussion that we're having today. Next slide, please. So one of the things that we know is that quality care matters. And I think that we've heard, um, you know, we've heard quality care uh, mentioned um, both by Mr. Ranke and Reverend Jones and, and really thinking about what that is. But I love this graph because I think to me, this, this demonstrates so very clearly why high quality care over time is really critical for children. So what we're looking at here are mean language scores by the time children are age five. Now we know that language scores are really predictive of, of a bunch of different things later on in life, including things like high school graduation. So getting a getting a, a good language score at age five is actually pretty important. What you see on the bottom here is an indicator of how of the quality of children's child care experience in their infancy toddler years and then in their preschool years. And so the red bar here represents, it says high, high, and that means that children, those are children who had high quality child care in both infant toddler and in preschool years. In the yellow or orange, you see high, low. So that was high, high quality in infancy toddler and then low quality in preschool. Green is low, high, so low quality in infant toddler, high quality in preschool, and then purple is low, low, so low quality across those early years of life. Now, what you see here, I think, is actually quite stunning because you start to see that it doesn't, you know, the, the effects of having high, high quality over, over the first five years of life 
are it's really it's really marked in these in these results. You have such higher language scores at age five if you had high quality that persisted over time. So it's not just enough for us to be thinking about giving kids a high dose of you know, high quality in infant toddler years or just a high dose of high quality in those preschool years. It's really important for us to think about the, the, the continuity of care and the continuity of high quality care. So as much as we wanna be thinking about, you know, infusing high quality here or there, it matters a little bit, but the biggest bang for our buck is really ensuring that kids have access to high quality early child care and early learning environments through over the course of those first years of life. Next slide, please. And so we're obviously talking a lot about, about child care settings today, and I think everybody wants to be thinking about child care settings. But I think one of the one of the other things that we know is that there are a lot of ways to support children and families throughout those early years. Um, and this is this is part of the work that that uh, my my uh, organization works on in the sense that, you know, when we look at children's waking hours, children spend about in those earliest years, spend about 20 percent of their time in formal learning environments and they spend the rest of their time outside in the world with their parents, caregivers, um, whoever is is in their lives, and it might be at laundromats, it might be at grocery stores, it might be, you know, walking to and from the bus at a bus stop, all of those kinds of places that make up that other space. Yes. And so as much as we want to support high quality child care, and we have talked you know, extensively about why that's so very important, I would also encourage us to think about some of these other effects and other ways to support high quality learning environments for kids and families. And that includes things like that uh, Reverend Jones mentioned about, you know, thinking about uh, high, um, uh, providing living wages for teachers and providing those additional supports um, for that for that environment. Next slide, please. And we are also then thinking about providing support in public spaces. So creating and reimagining public spaces to be places and spaces that are that are designed for kids and families, as many of our public spaces these days are not. Um, so playful learning landscapes is a movement to really reimagine public spaces in ways that that offer children and families playful learning opportunities in their everyday environment, in the places and spaces that they visit and spend time. It's based on the science of how children learn, the science of what kids need to learn to thrive in the future, and then based on community values. So everything is research-based and really kind of taking everything we know about how do humans learn with what we know kids need to learn now and into the future. And this you know, takes into account things that business owners and leaders tell us are, are skills that they hire for in, in terms of the workforce of the future. And then really based on a community's hopes and wishes and dreams for their children. Next slide, please. And so you can start to reimagine environments like this one. This is in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. It's a corner uh, corner bus stop um, with, an, with a previously empty lot in the top left corner. Transformed, reimagined to have things to do while you're waiting for the bus stop. Puzzles that work, spatial skills and math skills and literacy skills. We have, you know, opportunities for kids to be creative um, by, you know, guessing the guessing the shapes that they see in the shadows and this uh, in this sculpture and different, you know, a jumping feet game that works children's executive functioning skills, which we know are incredibly important. So you can start to reimagine environments. So yes, we want to be thinking, you know, very intentionally about high quality childcare, but I think we also want to be thinking about the the other all the of the other spheres and realms in which children and families spend time and how we might support children's development in those spaces. Next slide, please. And then all of that, of course, is in service of the growing brain. So really thinking about everything we know about early childhood and really infusing as much um, you know, effort as we can to really provide children with those high quality early learning experiences, whether they're in childcare or in the, the public realm, but really thinking about infusing that in, in terms of the, that continuity of care, the, the in, uh, zero to five age range in which kids have access to high quality learning environments throughout. Uh, next slide, please. So thank you so much. Um, it's been a pleasure to talk with you and I'm, I'm excited to answer some questions. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Glido. I really appreciate that. Um, it shows you how important those first five years are when you think of the size of their brain uh, during that time. Um, you know, you know it makes you realize that those five years go very quickly and we have to take advantage of them as much as we can. So um, we're going to have uh, questions right now, but I, I do want to make a, a quick comment. Um, uh, Senator uh, Kunze, our, my co-chair, and Senator Sykes, and Representative Humphrey and myself, obviously, 
are very in tune to uh, making some of the changes that uh, Reverend Jones and Mr. Ranke talked about. Um, but I think it would be beneficial for anyone that has um, any type of connection with other legislators to always reach out to them also to share some of the stories I'm, I'm thinking, especially of Reverend Jones up in the Toledo area, reaching out to all of his uh, legislators up there to get the type of data that he had. Uh, but right now, um, uh, all lawmakers, legislative aides, and representative from the governor's office uh, please unmute to ask your questions and start the conversation. All other particip particip participants, uh, please put your questions or comments into the chat as we move into the question and answer. And like I said, Molly, my legislative aide in my office, uh, will be handling the Q&A. Molly? Hi, everyone. Uh, we actually do have a few questions already that were typed in the chat uh, earlier in the webinar. Um, so the first question is, uh, daycare providers say that their uh, profit margins are very narrow, even though parents are paying extremely high costs for care and daycare workers manage to still qualify for Medicaid. Uh, where is the disconnect? And I assume that question is for uh, any of the three. Well, I'll, um, I'll, I'll jump in. Um, I think, um, one, I think the question is extremely relevant. Um, and I think it is a question that um, we've got to grapple with um, and wrestle with very, very, very directly. So I think a couple things, if I heard the question correctly, um, with all of the various levels of, of, of reimbursement, the profit margins for child care centers um, are still extremely thin. Um, and and what where is the disconnect? If they're getting dollars from here or from here, why is there um, still a disconnect? If I heard that question correctly, I think the answer is um, in a in a few different ways. And and by no means am I um, in a position to be the expert. A child care provider would be able to answer this very very directly. But in working with them, um, we found a couple things. Number one, um, the reimbursement levels that we see coming from. Um, individuals who may qualify for publicly funded child care and things of those natures, um, what we find is that those levels are still extremely low. Um, we are attempting to cover costs um, that are within a child care center. We're attempting to cover those costs on very intentional, thin reimbursement levels. So we have said, hey, let's try to give a few more dollars in pay to teachers and not really quantify the full cost of being able to operate a center at the high quality levels that we need to do it at. Um, so all the things that Ms. Lytle just shared about the brain science and things of that nature, those to have those um, the type of equipment and the type of learning tools and all of those things inside of a classroom to have, you know, windows bright and walls painted and all of those things that create an environment for learning, um, those things cost dollars. Um, and then more importantly, to pay the teachers what they should be paid, not what we've been paying them, but to pay them what we should what we should be paying them um, costs significant amounts of money. Um, and the cost really to do that inside of a child care center is much more than $10,000 um, per child per year. It's more in the fifteen to 20000 range of what the actual cost is. But the reimbursement levels are currently sitting at a five-star center is getting somewhere between uh, 10 or somewhere between twelve and $13,000 um, worth of reimbursement. It might be a little bit above 13 um, if they're a five-star center. Um, and, and we know that that is not near enough to cover the true cost of quality that exists in the center. If you're going to have a qualified teacher that is, you know, bachelor degreed, even associate degreed, if you're going to have those types of things, um, you have to do that. And then if you want to assess the space and do those various things that are necessary to provide the high quality, it's it's going to cost um, inside of that space. I will also say this um, is that the various levels 
um, that go along with the reimbursement, there is sort of this battle between how centers can use the dollars as it relates to reimbursement. So for instance, if some are getting um, the early childhood su education subsidy from the Ohio Department of Education, which is about 4250 a child, but that only covers a, n a certain number of hours of the day that the child can be in care receiving education. And so now you have to find another way to add in dollars. And so what we find is that our child care centers, on top of being the educational experts that they are, are now also having to become the business experts of finding a way to braid resources together, not go amok with how the regulation is set up to do it. And oh, by the way, hopefully mom and or dad has filled out the paperwork appropriately with their local job and family services office so they can get the reimbursement. I mean, it, it is, we tend to, and I'll stop with this, we tend to make life harder for individuals who need the most access. We right. tend to make it harder through the regulations that we offer them. And instead of focusing on the policy side and fixing it to make it easier for access, we actually make it harder for access. And then we say, oh, well, you can't make it work on $10. And we said we needed 15 all along. And I'll take a stab at it, too, on the disconnect. I'm going to go a little different way. I agree with um, the Reverend 100 percent. The um, and I'm going to take the facility uh, in um, Finley uh, on Birchhaven's. It's part of Birchhaven's campus up there. What we did there is we raised uh, about a million four hundred thousand to help build it, to help build it. They have four stages of uh, uh, child care, and all four of them uh, really pursue trying to develop the brain and all the other four uh, social skills that kids need. Uh, there, you know, because they're on uh, the campus there, Birchhaven or Blanchard Valley don't charge them uh, very much at all for rent. But there's all these other costs. The, the, the problem I see is if you, the higher quality that you provide, the higher quality services you provide, the less return on the bottom line. I mean, and, and that's kind of sad, but that's the way it is. So, I mean, the disconnect, you, one, you got to help the, the state. And I was talking to um, uh, my good friend, Lieutenant uh, Governor John Houston, uh, just last week on this issue. And and he said, and I agree with him, that, you know, we should have a private public partnerships to where um, the, the public that wants to develop and build and operate, an, uh, you know, child care gets some kind of credit um, or dollars. I mean, it could be split 50-50 where, where the state provides X amount of dollars a year to uh, help build and develop these centers, especially in rural areas. And then to you know, helping with the funding is is extremely important. I mean, I go to my own and in Finley, they do an incredible job because they take, you know, they go from, you know, birth to, you know, age six and there's four different stages. The cost to hire those teachers and to train them, um, you know, is just really a huge number. And inflation hurts right now. I mean, the inflation is out of control gas prices are out of control all these things you know electric utilities are out of control and uh child daycare centers i mean you know they could get hit with all these other expenses and if they're going up you know six seven eight percent a year i mean it really digs into the bottom line because the resources aren't staying up with the expenses and cost so we got to find a way to work with the ohio legislature and i really appreciate the legislative folks that are on here today, but it's such a really important issue. We've got to figure out how to keep the uh, ahead of the operating expenses. And we've got to figure out how to build more of these communities, especially in the rural areas. And I think the only thing that I would add to this, I think those are those are excellent answers. And I think the only thing I would add is just to remind us that, you know, we're, we're thinking about the, the ratios of, of, you know, staff to children that we're thinking about in these early years are, are not what you see in the K-12 system. So when you're thinking infant toddler, you're probably looking at, you know, one to five, one to six in terms of, of teachers to, to, to children. Um, as you get a little bit older, you're maybe one to eight, one to nine. Um, but, you know, so I think, you know, if you're putting an infant in care, you're automatically paying, you have to expect to pay at least 20 
20% of, of one person's time, right? And so I think that it's just something to remind us of that, that you know, as we think about, you know, what high quality care looks like, that it's, it is expensive. Great. Thank you, everyone. I appreciate it. Uh, we do have one more question in the chat. Um, this one is directed towards Reverend Jones. Um, some parents are opting out of or cutting back from the workforce due to the cost of child care. It doesn't make financial sense to work for the sole purpose of paying for child care. When this happens, parents that aren't full-time students or without a disability may no longer be eligible for certain tax benefits such as the child care tax credit. This is particularly true if a parent didn't earn enough money in a given year, but their child still had to receive care for whatever reason. What steps are we taking to ensure that families are receiving as many tax breaks as possible to offset the cost of child care throughout the year? Thank you. So that was directed to me. Um, so let me <laughs> jump in. Um, um, I think, um, and 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 others can you know obviously jump in. I think there's there's a couple of things. Number one, by no means am I a tax professional. I uh, hard to um to 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 dig through some of this space. What I do know is that um, as we continue to talk about this, and I'll sort of take the answer in a little bit different way because I think all the things that the um, person asking the question. Um, was spot on because there's varying levels um, within the tax code that, you know, provide some tax credit, but then if they don't hit certain thresholds, it limits them. Um, we have had a few conversations um, with folks in the governor's office, um, and we are working to try to have even more um, collectively as a group. So I mentioned this, you know, sort of loose coalition of Ohio pre-K entities um, really working to try to have this conversation across those groups with in partnership with folks like Groundwork Ohio and others. And now obviously with, with this wonderful and robust collection here, the challenge that we see is that there are not many, and Don Ranke was just answering this question just a little bit in his discussion that he had with the Lieutenant Governor. Um, once you get past the ones that you just mentioned about, you know, the child care tax credit, and if they don't qualify for it in that way, and, and where do they hit, many of our families run off that threshold. They don't you know, um, um, hit several of those criteria in order to get it. And then there is no other recourse, right? And that's the problem that we're facing. So I think the, the best way for me to answer this is that we have to do more of a push in conversations like these, but then to get more collective uh, buy-in around the need for there to be more um, conversations and then actual legislation put forward to create these tax credit um, scenarios for families based on the ones that we just heard. It is not advantageous to the questioner's um, question. It's not advantageous at all for many of them, it, uh, many of the families, because they do run into these various pockets or donuts, whatever you want to call it, where they're not getting the tax credit because they aren't earning enough or they earn too much or however that works um, inside of the space. And many of them fit in, in one side or the other. So I think for us, is we've got to have more conversations like this, but then we have to move past the conversation relatively quickly because I think we know the issue. Now what it takes is for us to get a collective buy-in from enough of, of our friends that are in the General Assembly to really have the discussion about this is what the families need on the ground. And if they don't get that, then you're going to see um, more families um, having to you know, struggle to not just take care of their kids, but then also to put food on the table and do all those different things. Those are the pieces that we've got to have. And it's very clear and evident to me um, that the opportunities to access those potential tax credits, they just don't exist once you pass that threshold. So I hate to answer it that way, but there, the answer sort of is there is nothing else out there after that. And so then the question becomes, and you know, very few things I'll say, the question becomes then how are we going to create those? And I think it starts with conversations like this. I think it then has to quickly move to um, real discussions around strategy and legislation that we can move quickly on that can help the, um, um, provide relief for our families immediately. Did anyone want to add anything to the question? 
you know, I'm happy okay. to, I'm happy to add a little bit. If we, if we got time, we don't have time. I understand. Um, but Reverend Jones was absolutely right with what he was saying, but there needs to be funding mechanisms, you know, for, for people that want to build, develop and operate there. And, and that could come through, uh, the General Assembly, you know, they could set aside so much a year to develop and build. Uh, and it would be like a match, it could be a match to where that developer or that operator would have to match what the state puts in, um, you know, whether it was through a mortgage or, or cash or whatever. And then obviously, uh, we're just so far behind in what it costs to, you know, operate uh, a child care facility. So, uh, there could be property tax incentives uh, that could be passed where, you know, you, um, the developer, or the owner, or the operator would be eligible for property tax incentives. Um, you know, that's something that, you know, we're looking at here in Delaware County. Uh, be an easier system to, to qualify. Uh, River Jones was 100% right, you know. It, it's extremely hard uh, to even apply and get things moving, let alone uh, getting the vouchers. But um, and then I think you know there should be a priority system for those areas that are in, in a desert, and I mean priority dollars there. So it's just really you know crazy. I know that uh, it took us, you know, my wife and I, you know, eight years to save as much as we could, and then it took it took a while to find you know, a sitter, a babysitter. And we had a really, we had to find some of this good quality babysitter back then. This is back in the nineties, but just, this is a really important issue. Um, I know the state's sitting on a huge rainy day fund. I, I think this could be a collaboration of private public dollars um, almost in every way to, to get it resolved quickly. Uh, thank you to everyone for your thoughtful questions and answers. Um, are there any uh, questions from legislators or legislative aides? Okay, I will turn it back over to Representative Manning. Thank you. Thank you, Molly, and thank you all for the questions and uh, the responses. Uh, I think uh, those of you who heard the state of the state, Governor DeWine, is certainly involved in a lot of this. We'd like to see some changes. I think we need to start thinking outside the box, uh, sliding scales when it comes to tax credits, um, employers having more skin in the game um, when it comes to um, um, finding childcare and you know different things like that, but um, also trying to find more dollars to uh, help in these situations. Uh, thank you again for joining the Children's uh, Caucus webinar. Thanks also to our panelists for sharing their expertise with us. If you have any unanswered questions or want to learn more about the child care policy in Ohio, please reach out to Kelly uh, Viserol at Children's Defense Fund, Ohio. And I hope all of you have a lovely afternoon. Thank you uh, so much for joining us. Bye-bye.